On our last episode, we learned about long distance bike packing, especially about the long distance trails across and up and down the United States. So today I thought it'd be fun to revisit bike packing the Erie Canal from Buffalo down to Albany. It's one of my more popular past episodes and I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Active Travel Adventures podcast. I'm your host, Kit Parks. I'm excited to bring today's episode to you where we're going to be bikepacking. That is, going on a tour, taking an adventure trip with your bike. In this case, she's camping, but it, you could also go to hotels. There's ways to do that as well. And Mimi, our guest today, is going to talk about her bikepacking trip on the Erie Canal. But the things that we talk about today can be applied to any type of adventure of this kind. I'm super excited to share this whole concept with you. And with that, let's get started. When my sister Terry's girlfriend, Mimi Massé, went on a bikepacking trip, I was very intrigued. So when she got back, I asked if she would come on the show and tell us a little bit about it. It's an adventure that I have covered on the show, but not one that I've ever done by myself, nor have I interviewed somebody that this is extremely exclusively what they did. So welcome to the program, Mimi. I sure appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks, Kit. Before we get started, just so we get a little bit of idea of who Mimi is and who we're talking to today, would you mind just giving us a little bit of your adventure background and perhaps how old you are? I am 57. I recently retired at the beginning of 2020, and I've gone on several bike packing trips before, and I'm just a bike enthusiast. And so what got you into biking in the first place? I don't drive and I live in the city and I just I was living in Philadelphia at the time I bought one of my first bikes and I ended up buying a vintage bike. And so I got into vintage bicycling and I commute. That's how I commute. Very cool. And then you took that a step further and went bikepacking. How about explaining what bikepacking is? How did I stumble across it? I don't even recall, but I came late to bike to camping. And then I thought the whole idea of camping while riding and carrying all your gear and all the necessities in a small package intrigued me. None of my friends were interested. So I reached out to Adventure Cycle and that was my first trip through an organization. Oh, cool. All right. And that's one of the things I talk about in the show is how you take the baby steps and you're smart. You didn't just jump right into it. You went with somebody that knew what they were doing so you could kind of learn some of the ropes and tips And I'm not familiar with Adventure Cycle. Tell us a little bit about them and where did you go? They've been in business since the 1970s. I just found them on the internet and they have a lot of different rides and a variety of skill levels. So you could go on one of your rides and they'll carry all your gear. Well, I was really interested in the self-contained ride. And the ride that interests me was to Cape Cod in that area. Very cool. Very cool. Was that the first time you ever met or knew anybody that when it was yourself actually doing the bikepacking? Yes. There was a crew of 12 of us, including the guide. And so it was six women, six men. I don't think anybody knew anyone. It was all single people. And we camped together. We did stay at a hostel, ate all our meals together. And along the way, I ended up meeting my friend Paul We just happen to ride at the same speed, break at the same time, and he had the same temperament as I do. And so he's become my bikepacking friend. Cool. So roughly how many bikepacking trips have you done? Let's say eight. (laughs) That's a good broad experience too. So this time you biked the Erie Canal. First of all, where is it? What makes it special? Why this particular trip? We wanted to do an off-road trip. So the canal is a like a rail to trail, but it's a canal to trail, or the trail was there originally. And Paul had done half of it before. And several other friends of mine were interested, and they live in Connecticut in New York. So we decided to, why don't we go to the Erie Canal? We'll all meet up there. It's from Buffalo to Albany, or Albany to Buffalo. You were doing, it looks like, about 40 miles a day, roughly? Yeah, a little over 40 miles, never 50, so somewhere in the 40-mile range. We decided to pick that because you're breaking down camp, you're loading up, you bike, you stop for lunch, you bike again, and then you find camp. 
And it just is a nice spread out day. You're not having to rush. You're not having to put your tent up in the dark. And it's enough mileage. I have come to learn that that is a nice mileage only because Terry, the same sister, put me on the Batan bicycle march last fall. We did 50 miles in a day when I hadn't drained it all. And not standing up on the bike at the last 10 miles, my bottom was so sore. Yeah. About how long are you on the bike each day? I never even thought of that. I think we were doing rails to trails up here in the DC area, and we were doing a roughly 10 miles an hour when we weren't stopping. Does that sound about right? So about maybe half a day? That sounds about right. Yeah, 10 to 15. Okay. And then we were stopping along the way, too, to see sites. Right. And this is gently sloped, too, because it's along the canal. Yeah, it's pretty level. It's pretty flat. At times, they were small hills, but on the most part, it was pretty flat. Okay. And then what kind of landscapes and towns do you see? What are you seeing along the way? At times, you're pretty rural. So you're just riding a path and you're in between trees or trees in the canal. And you're also hitting the old canal and the new canal. So it's really well marked. There are some glitches when you have to go through cities and that we had to rely on our own Google Maps or whatever you have available. But I would say on the most part, it's really well marked. So you're going through small towns, sometimes neighborhoods, but the canal is just either wide open to fields or you're going through trees. And so are you on the towpath where they used to tow the barges up? Yes. Okay. So can you describe what a towpath is? So towpath, it is 360 miles. I just saw that. Some of the times you're riding through just a little wheel path with grass on either side. Other times, the towns and the parks and trails of New York have kept up the trails. So they can be really, really nice, either crushed limestone or they could be paved. You have a variety of trails. It can get a little slippery with the mud trails. We didn't have much problem with that, but it's a variety. And what kind of bike did you take? My bike is a touring bike. So it's a steel touring bike. I got it in 2012. It just fit me. I know there's a lot of new bikes now that are built for more of this long haul trail riding. But this one, is it's a Mossy and it's fully loaded. Panniers in the back and front, front handlebar bag and a back trunk bag. Well, that was one of the questions I was going to ask a little bit later. Somebody may not know what a pannier is. Why don't you describe how you're storing all of your gear? On my bike, there are two racks, one in the back over the back wheel and one in the front wheel. And on those racks, you can connect bags. So on either side of the wheel are two bags. In the front, I tend to carry my smaller bags and then the back, my larger bags. And each bag for me is organized by what I'm carrying. So I have a camp bag, which is my tent, my sleeping pad, my sleeping bag, and all the things that would accompany the tent. The other bag is full of food a critter food bag, assorted cooking gear, plates, utensils. Front bag is all my clothing, which isn't that much. And I can explain this later, but there is washing available. So I ended up taking only three t-shirts. And then the other bag is odds that you just want for luxury, maybe a camping chair, pad, other little pieces. Okay, cool. Oh, any idea what I'll weigh? (laughs) The bike is heavy. When you're off of it, it's very heavy. I would say, gosh, somewhere between 80 pounds. And it's hard to move around. There's one wonderful piece of equipment that I highly recommend for anybody who's doing this. It's called a steer stopper. And it connects down to your top rail. And it stops the front tire from moving. And when you've got all of that weight on your tire and you just want to pull off, even to go to the bathroom, you lock that down. You could lean just the front tire against a tree and the bike will stand up. So can you please clarify what that thing is for? It's just to maintain your bike from flopping because if you get off, you have all this weight in the front and it just the tire wants to turn right or left. And this just maintains the bike in one position. I highly recommend it. Okay. That sounds like a good investment. Walk us through what a typical day was like. So we would get up probably around seven, eight o'clock make ourselves some coffee. Sometimes we did breakfast. Other times we would go to breakfast in the upcoming town. 
And then we'd break down our gear, load our bikes back up, which I love that process. And I didn't mind doing it two times a day for nine days. And then head out, look at the map, get together. There was four of us. So we kind of looked at the map. This is where we're heading. This is where we're thinking about stopping for lunch because you do tend to break apart. My girlfriend, Jane, she would ride ahead, but we would always check in with each other. And then we'd stop and either have lunch at a place or stop at, there are many picnic areas and along the canal, they're all the locks and they usually have picnic areas there. So you can just find yourself someplace to eat. It's a beautiful setting. We'd make lunch with what we brought with us and then get back on the bike, head out. It's just riding and maybe pausing, talking, not talking, and just taking in the scene. And then we'd arrive at our destination, whatever campground or what's really neat on the Erie Canal. You can camp at some of the locks free of charge and there will be toilets or even washing and drying. And if it isn't free of charge, it's at a minimal cost, $10 for the night. Nice. And so how do you find this out in advance? How did you plan this trip? We left Paul doing all the coordination of the actual trip because he had done half of it before. So he knew half of the places to go. And then because of COVID, it was a little more trickier. We did have to call campsites to make sure they were even open. So there was a lot more phone calls to make. He did pay in advance for some of the sites. I took on our trip. So what we did is met in Albany. We then loaded our bikes onto the Amtrak, which you have to make reservations for, but they will take, I think there are up to four bikes spaces available. And then we rode to Buffalo, unloaded, and then stayed at a hotel for the night. So I did all that kind of planning, hotel rooms, Amtrak tickets. Do you have to plan in advance or can you just show up and wing it? I think I'd plan in advance. Is wild camping allowed or that's a no-no? You could probably get away with it, but it's a little hard on the canal. I think campgrounds are better. Okay. All right. And because this is a popular trail, I'm, I'm guessing they're spaced about a day apart at least? Yeah. Sometimes we couldn't even find campgrounds that you had to stay at the canal stops. And perhaps that's why they're there. Yeah. Okay. It's been figured out, basically. Is there a website that we can direct people to that will help them? The Parks and Trail New York has a wonderful cycling area canal. That website, and we both, Paul and I, purchased the map, which fits beautifully in your top bag. And it is really well marked. It gives things to do trail notes, visitor information, amenities, and each page has a nice amount of riding on it and it's fairly detailed. Cool. All right. So I'm going to put links to all that in the show notes. And you talk about, Paul, tell us a little about your group and the group dynamics. What's the pros and the cons of going with a group versus doing something like this yourself? Paul and I had met at that adventure cycle group. And then we had just, he and I had gone on several trips together. He's from the Carolinas, and so we meet depending on where we're going. I've taken a train to him before, and we've done the Maryland Shore. Paul's a great guy, super laid back. I think that's why we get so well together, and we've done like several trips together fine. The other two people are good friends. It's funny because you get to know each other more when you're on a trip like this. And in a different way. And in a different way, very much so. So it was interesting and there was some butting of heads. It all worked out and just open communication, of course, is good. We travel at different paces, but I think if there's that open communication as to where we're going, where we're stopping, that helps a lot. Were all the participants of fairly comparable training level and fitness level? And did you have to train? Tell us a little bit about your preparation ahead of time. Well, for me, I had a bit of dilemma. I have bad knees and I had surgery on my hand, so I didn't get to train much. I actually had two quarter zone shots in my knees to prep for this, but I ride regularly. It's not fast paced. There's not a lot of hills. So I wasn't too worried about this trip. My girlfriend, Jane, is a really strong rider. She does a lot of indoor training. The other man, Sam, 
is also a frequent rider. The age group was mid 50s to uh, mid 60s. Do you train with weights on the bike so you're not startled that first day? No. (laughs) Which would be a good way to do it, wouldn't it? It is startling though. But then once you're riding, it's amazing you don't feel the weight. You really don't. A little segue here. I ended up breaking my foot on the second day. Oh, brother. And didn't know it. I mean, I knew something was wrong, but luckily it did not bother me cycling. It was more off the bike that I had the problems with. So I made an eight-day trip on a broken foot. Is it going to heal properly? It did. Okay, good. And you said you're camping. So you are tent camping or you're in cabins or what's the situation? Tent camping. And if somebody doesn't want to camp, are there towns that they could stay in a hotel? Well, my friend Jane was uh, not a camper and she was intending on getting Airbnbs all over the place in hotels, which is a little harder to do. You can do it. She ended up staying a hotel one night because of a storm and then an Airbnb another night because she had work to do. But I'm all in for the camping. And the other gentlemen, Sam and Paul and I camped every night. You mentioned the storms. And my next question was going to be about the weather. When did you go? And what kind of weather did you have? And would you recommend going at that time of year? Yes, we went early June. And the weather was wonderful on the most part. Sometimes jackets in the morning. Sometimes just down to t-shirts. It got a little warm. We did have rain but we carry rain gear. It wasn't horrible rain, didn't last long, but I think there was three storms. And then at night, there was a hurricane that was coming up the coast. And we ended up staying at a fairly large shelter at one of the canals, which was open, but you were covered. And it was a concrete shelter that would normally be used for picnic tables or even events because there was a stage There were several of us there in our group and then a couple from Colorado and then some boaters pulled in. So there was about 10 of us staying in that shelter and the wind was whipping through, but otherwise we didn't get wet. Okay, cool. So that's actually probably early spring that far north. Yes. Okay. All right. I wonder what the summers were probably pretty pleasant as well or no? Uh, I would imagine so. That's the first time for me up in that area. I'll look into that and also put some links to the weather in the show notes as well, because I imagine that far north, you probably have a good window in through September at least. Yeah. I mean, I'm up for any kind of riding, even cold weather riding is kind of nice too. I'm not into cold weather camping though. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you have the experience, but one of the questions I was going to ask you is what do you wish you'd pack that you did not pack or something that people often forget to pack? You mentioned that one item. Is there anything else that, oh man, that's a really nice thing to have when you're bikepacking? No, I think because I've done it so many times, I've taken everything I've needed. This trip, I took too much, so I eliminated some things. One thing that I do enjoy carrying is a tiny little iron skillet and I make egg sandwiches. So I carry a whole 12 pack of eggs and make little egg sandwiches in the morning. That's a treat. And are you resupplying food throughout the way? Are you bringing all your food for the nine days? Not entirely the nine days. Paul and I were pretty good at bringing our food and what we thought we needed. We kind of sometimes will share. He'll bring the bread. I'll bring the tuna. Jane and Sam were less prepared. So we did have to make some food stops for especially Jane. But I think she's got it now. She fell in love with the whole idea of it and wants to go on another trip. And it's a definite learning process. It really is. I mean, we've learned by talking from you because you've done it. That's why when I learned how to backpack, I went with people that backpacked. I saved a fortune in buying the right gear instead of making mistakes and learning all their tips and tricks. So this is tremendously helpful. Exactly. Yeah. But you mentioned you overpacked. So what did you take you wish you didn't take? One time, Paul and I, the trip to Maryland Shore area, we really could have used a mosquito netting. It's something big just to cover the picnic table with. He was getting bit eaten up. I brought that one unnecessary. I don't know if I'd even drag it again. By talking about that, though, I can give a suggestion for you from my backpacking. There's something smaller than the size of your fist that doesn't probably even weigh an ounce. It's a bug head net. I do have one of those. Yeah. Takes up no room. At least you get some off your face. 
Yeah. Jane had those. She's more allergic to mosquito bites. They tend not to bother me. So that's why I, I'm not as pressed. I also bought a bag that you can wash your clothes in. Okay. I've seen those, but I've not used those before. Yeah. I've used them before. They're great, but we had so many washers and dryers along the way, not needed. And I think if you get that map ahead of time, you'll be able to see whether or not it's a good idea to bring it. Yes, exactly. Looking at the facilities, calling the facilities, they'll tell you what they have available. Now you chose to use the panniers. A lot of people prefer just to strap their gear to the bike. They say panniers are noisy. What do you feel are the pros and cons of the two methods? Ooh, I couldn't even imagine strapping all the gear I had to my bike. You definitely need the panniers. They just carry everything for you. And when you get to camp, you pop all the bags off individually and you can carry them individually. So your cooking one goes on the picnic table, which is there's always a picnic table. And then your camping gear, you take out and put your tent together. It also keeps everything well contained and dry if there are night storms. Plus, you can put all your gear under your rain flap and it's protected. Now, we talked about the food and water. How about water? Accessible water? Do you have to restop? Are you purifying your water? Or tell us about that. Along the stops, especially campgrounds and even the canal stops, there are it's water spigots. So we never had to gather water out of running like out of the canal or anything like that. There was always available water. And I carry two drinking bottles on my bike and then one larger bottle that's insulated full. And then you can always stop if you need it. There's enough places to stop or share with other people. I, this time, decided to bring my own electrolyte additive. So I bought a bag of, and I would just scoop it in instead of relying on Gatorade or anything else. All right. I know people often do that when they're going on long hikes as well. If you get your electrolytes out of balance, it can actually be a pretty big problem. Yeah. So have you heard of an organization called Warm Showers? Yes, I have. And have you ever used them? No, I haven't. But it's always fun. These trips, you meet so many people. People find it fascinating that your bike is so loaded and they stop and talk to you. And I think we had a couple of people from Warm Showers come up to us. How about explain for those that don't know what Warm Showers is? Tell us about it. I just found out about them in this trip. So I know that it's a network of individuals who put their names on a list And you can go to their home, either camp in their yard, they invite you in to stay, and they provide uh, warm showers and, I guess, sometimes meals. Yeah, it depends. It depends. But for a nominal fee, I think it's only one-time fee or a -a once-a-year fee. I I can't remember which, but it's not a case for something less than one hotel night. But you get to meet these people that they're long-distance bikers, too. And so it just kind of help each other out. And it's not just in the United States. It's across the world. Oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know enough about them. Yeah, no, it's it's a terrific organization. So when you're looking back on your trip, Mimi, what are some of your favorite memories? I count all the critters I see. So I keep a running log and just in my memory of all the creatures that pass me or I see on the way. So that's always a fun thing to do. So I have a list from all my trips. What were some of the more interesting ones you saw on this trip? Oh, I've never seen so many groundhogs. Interesting. The chipmunks beat them out in the last two days, but there was a large amount of groundhogs running in front of us as well. I think biking and doing that all day and you come, you stop for your lunch and you make this simple tuna sandwich. It just tastes so wonderful. That's, <laughs> that's, that's like a highlight for me. Oh, well, that's the same as backpacking. The first day, the food tastes nasty, but the second day, I don't care what you put in your mouth. It's fantastic. It is. <laughs> just so hungry and you're just so appreciative of any luxury. Yeah. Then the realization, it'll hit you that you've been outdoors for so many days. You're living, you're outdoors constantly. And that to me is pretty cool too. Right. And like backpacking, which is the only thing I can relate to because I haven't done this yet, is you realize too that everything you need fits on, in my case, my back, in your case, your bike. Yes. And then when you get home, you're like, what do I have all this stuff for? Yes. Everything I needed, I had. (laughs) Exactly. I love that. I love condensing it all down and making it all fit in a puzzle and just surviving off of that. It helps re-anchor you somehow. Yeah, really does. So speaking of that, so what's the drive? What makes bikepacking so special for you? 
I've said, well, I'm going on vacation. I'm doing this and people like vacation. It's a lot of work. You know, your body can hurt. You can be in pain. It can be exhausting. You can get a little cranky. But for me, it's the uncomfortableness of it. I like that challenge. Because life otherwise is pretty cushy. And I love being outdoors. I love camping in a tent. So that's what drives me. I'd love to do more of it. Been recently in touch with Paul and trying to plan something else. Cool. And a lot of times too, when on adventures like this, the weather could be really bad the whole week. Then we call that type two fun. It may not be fun while you're slogging through it, but when you look back and you laugh about it and that it becomes a fond memory, that storm that you went through or whatever the case might be. Yeah. There's a, the trip I did with Paul on the shore. We had a massive storm come by and we're in the woods and we are tent to tent. We were pretty tight on this little tenting pad and the storm was so loud. We couldn't even speak through the tent walls to each other. We had to text each other. It was an incredible storm. And just to be in mother nature like that is exciting. And that ends up being like that. That's one of your key memories from that trip. Oh, totally. <laughs> you and I are kindred spirits. I can't wait to meet you in person. Yeah. So how does this particular bikepacking trip compare to some of the others that you've taken? This was different because of the amount of people. It's usually just Paul and I. Okay. How about either for beauty or what recommendations would you have for people of the bikepacking trips that you've taken saying, oh, definitely, if you're going to do it, this is the one you want to do? I recommend definitely doing some off-road trails like the Erie Canal or even the Gap Trail. It just alleviates the worry about cars. But if you plan a road trip like the one at the shore, we would ride hours on backcountry roads without seeing one car. So it can be done, and there's a beauty to both of them. There's so many aspects that are enjoyable when you're riding along and you kind of don't even feel your body doing what it's doing. And it's amazing, that part. And there's so many interesting things about bikepacking that I enjoy. If somebody says, okay, maybe that sounds interesting. I want to do it. Would you recommend maybe doing like a three-day week, dipping their feet in to see what it's like, or just, all right, I'm going all in. I'm going to do the Erie Canal. Any advice on that? I guess it would be up to you. On the first trip, even with an organized trip, I was nervous and it was hard. It was much longer days and a little more responsibility one day because you had to do all the cooking for the entire group, which I did not care for. But I think a three-day trip would be a good start. Why not? And challenge yourself to the next one. Is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't? Yeah, gear. I guess, you know, that would be beneficial for a three-day trip. You could see what works for you for clothing-wise and shoe-wise. And that way, you could be more comfortable on a longer trip. Other stuff that's needed, there's so many resources. You could YouTube resources of what I bring on a bike bike, bike packing trip and then make your decisions off of that. But I I would do a little research into it. And I would recommend my Adventure Travel Show podcast episode on it where I did do the research for you. And I'll put links to that in the show notes as well. Any final words of advice or any information you'd like to share with us before we sign off? Gosh, we covered a lot. You had wonderful questions. I really can't think of anything else I want to add. All right. So then where are you and Paul? Are you planning on going next? I think we're going to take a little bit of a shorter trip down his way. I feel bad. He's always driving up here. So (laughs) I think we're going, uh, I can't remember the name of the trail, but it'll be only maybe a four or five day trip. It's down south. Nice. I really appreciate you coming on the program, Amy. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's been fun. Thank you for inviting me. I interviewed Mimi prior to my Croatian bike and boat tour, where I had the opportunity to, we island hop, we stayed in a boat overnight, and then went island to island, working our way from Split down to Dubrovnik. And I found I love biking holidays. So now my next plus one will be to do some type of a bike packing trip. Maybe I'll do something for a weekend. And then I do have in my mind that I'd like to do the Katy Trail and some other, the longer rails to trails. So I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about bike packing and bike touring in the future. I haven't mentioned it in a while, but I do have a companion podcast called the Adventure Travel Show Podcast, 
that teaches you the how-tos of adventure travel. And there is an episode on bike packing, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. I encourage you to check it out and check out all the episodes I have over there. I've done a lot of research on all the topics that I covered that I think puts the information in a concise way that I think you'll get a lot out of it. I hope you've enjoyed today's show. Until next time, this is Kit Parks, Adventure On.